this evening and joining me from Lismore in far north New South Wales. And um, I can't see anybody there, so it's a little bit uh, challenging. Um, but um, so I um, started off my career in education uh, when I was still in high school and in secondary school in Ireland, and I did work experience at uh, the School for Travellers in Bray and at St Michael's House uh, for uh, working with children with disabilities as well. And um, it's been a very circuitous route getting into education here. And um, I trained initially as um, a Steiner kindergarten teacher. And I've worked in the Steiner school system both in Ireland and over here. And then I did my bachelor's education to be a primary school teacher. And then I got sponsored by the Department of Education to do a master's in special education specifically to be a learning and support teacher. Um, and that's what I do now. I'm a learning and support teacher in uh, high school. So um, and the, a learning and support teacher would be on a par with a resource teacher in the Irish school system. So working specifically with students with special needs and learning difficulties and doing all the admin support around what their needs are in school. Um, so I, I'm going to be talking to you this evening about um, orientation days and, and what you can see on the slide there, um, and uh, filling in a bit more about what um, Angela and Dipna have said about different aspects of the curriculum and, and leading into what Dan's going to be talking about after me. Um, so I'm jumping in here at the point where, assuming that you have decided where your student is going to school, and you'll be looking at orientation days. And so when you've decided where your little one's going to go to school, you will be invited to um, visit the primary school. Um, your student uh, will, your child will, um, possibly go to uh, like five mornings of orientation a week, or they might go to one morning a week for several weeks. Every school does it a little bit differently. Um, and the same thing would happen when they're going into high school. Um, all the students from a catchment um, come to that high school and have orientation days to, to find out what their school's about and, and how the routines work and find a way around. So, that's my experience is uh, the greatest fear that students have in starting school is about getting lost and so that's a big thing and um, helping them to find a way around and getting to meet some new people. Um, when your um, child starts um, at um, kindergarten, they will do an assessment, so generally in all public schools um, they do what's called best start assessment. Um, and that's assessing the level of literacy and numeracy that your child is at. And like Dinkin said, there's lots of things about uh, how willing and able your child is to engage with others, whether they're able to have joint attention, whether they're able to pay attention to something alongside and with somebody else. So they're, they're critical factors in their successful start in school. Um, they assess um, how they engage with text and um, it's not always a level playing field because assessments I worked in a school out west and I think one of the elements of the best start assessment has something to do with traffic lights in it and whether the children recognise the meaning of those kind of stoplight colours. Now I worked in a school where the nearest traffic light was 300 kilometres away. So that's uh, a three, three hours drive it was, three hours drive to the nearest traffic light. So, Sometimes those things can be a bit of a nonsense, and um, you know, you have to be um, wary of your child being pigeonholed into being at a certain point um, of readiness. Um, but when that assessment is concluded, it's a one to one with the kindergarten teacher and the student, and when it's concluded, you'll get a report sent home um, which uh, looks at each of the domains that they look at and it tells you what you can do at home to, to lift. Um, development in each area and and how that will support the learning that's going to happen at school. So, you know, some people question the merits of it and the flip side is it can be really helpful in helping you know what to do. Um, um, 
for you know, the orientation in high school is the same. And um, if your child has any um, recognized learning difficulties or disability, um, I can't emphasize enough about getting in there early, early, early and let the school know what, um, if there have been any assessments done, what, what's, what your child is experiencing and what you experience about your child's needs. Um, because at your local primary school will work with the local district office to find a suitable placement for your child that may be at your local primary school and they are obliged to provide an education to everybody. Um, there's a few get out clauses in that. Um, for example, if your child might be, um, if your child had a physical mobility needs and the school sort of around the corner already had ramps built and um, or had a lift system in place, that they would recommend that you actually place in that other school so that they don't have to um, also put the same services in place potentially for one student. And you could argue against that, that's still your choice. So there's a lot of flexibility in the Australian education system and um, and certainly my experience um, is that the, the schools will go out of the way to um, accommodate you. Um, uh, on the next slide, with a, a map of how the school system really works, so what you're actually getting yourself into. Um, so we use a little bit different language. In Ireland, we talk about primary, secondary, and third level education. So over here, it's primary, high school, and tertiary. I've never heard that word until I got to Australia. Um, so the pathway through school is sort of mapped out a little bit there, what you're getting into at kindergarten level, and, and where that goes to. And certainly, um, as you move through into high school, there are a multitude of options, different pathways, whether it's doing partial work at school, and partly going to tech, like the tech institute is like, is like the BEC colleges, um, and you know, your student has loads of options, whether they want to take the academic route through school, or whether they want to do partial work experience. I have a student in my school who works in a childcare centre one day a week, goes to the tech one day a week, and does the other days at school. It's called, it's called a school-based traineeship. Um, but loads of options, and the pathway into university is, is um, very much more open, I think, than in Ireland, and the, the options for um, people to get into university when they haven't um, done particularly well in the leaving search are wide open um, and sometimes it's even advantageous to um, if you when you finish the leaving search to take a bit of a break because um, you're assessed for um, student support services based on your income as, as an independent young person as opposed to being assessed against your family's income if you want to go to uni later. So it's a bit down the track probably for lots of you because you're um, prospective um, school attenders and not quite there yet, I think. Um, so I did, uh, like Angela said, and lots of the subjects cross over with what you can do in Ireland. Um, I think it's important that you know as well, like some of you may be um, travellers across the world, you know, you might be in, in here in Australia for two years, going to the Middle East for a couple of years, back to Ireland, who knows. And there are plenty of options. Um, well, the Star School system has a curriculum that very easily translates across uh, the world. But there are also lots of schools, in, particularly in Sydney, that um, run the International Baccalaureate. And so that's something that 